now we are looking at the very last of the book of Acts, and what we're going to find here is we, we find a detailed account of a six-month journey at sea. The Apostle Paul is going to be going on a, a, a journey in a, a boat for six months. How many of you like to go on a cruise for six months? Wouldn't it be kind of fun to try that? Six-month cruise? Well, this was no cruising, all right? <laughs> cruise you get all the food you want to eat you know and everything's taken care of and maid service and everything going on you know and all kinds of stuff not this kind of situation not what Paul was in he was not in that kind of a thing and in fact uh, there's a lot of hazard for them traveling and we'll find as we get through this now this is a very detailed story of travel on the Mediterranean some have said that this story that we have the last two chapters of Acts is the most detailed in ancient history of any travel on the Mediterranean. You know, Homer wrote his Iliad and Odyssey, and in the Odyssey he has a, a description of a voyage on the Mediterranean. But even that description of the voyage is not as detailed as what Luke gives us here in the book of Acts. So what we're reading is, <clears throat> as people have said, and I haven't read all the ancient literature, but as I'm reading and I can peruse through things, some have made the comment that this is the most detailed uh, voyage, uh, description of a voyage in all of ancient history. Now, there was a voyage on the Mediterranean in the Old Testament. Anybody remember what that was about? A voyage in the Old Testament on the Mediterranean. Oh, you'll know it when you hear about it. Jonah, absolutely. Jonah. And he was out there, and guess what happened to the ship? You know, it hit a storm. Now, God brought that storm up, but... And the way to get relief from that storm was to throw Jonah overboard. But I tell you, there was a lot of trouble, and people were very concerned about traveling on the Mediterranean. And as we're going to get through this and look at this, <clears throat> there were certain times that you just did not travel because of the condition of the winds. They were always blowing in a certain direction. Uh, there were uh, cyclone-type things that would come up on the sea. There are times in, around here when we have, it's kind of like tornado season, the spring, May, uh, um, June sometimes, and some of those, those, uh, m those months for us. During these months that we're going to talk about, as we're going to read, they are getting real close to that time of the worst weather on the Mediterranean. And they're going to run up against that, and we're going to see some of the things that happen. Now, you already know the story, but I think it's fascinating to go through this. And it's going to be, it's, 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 I hope it's fun for you, it's fun for me to look at it and study it. And so we have a, in front of us, basically, these last two chapters are a small classic. It's a classic story of a voyage. Um, not Gilligan, Gilligan's Island, you know, they talk about a, a voyage. Um, but this is the one that really happened. And uh, not just because it's instructive in seamanship, because we're going to hear about some of the things that are going to be talked about. It's not just to give us a detailed story for our information, so we can say, oh, look at that information. God has a reason for why he writes everything in the Bible. And so we're going to learn that there are some moral and spiritual lessons to be learned even in this story that we're going to talk about. And so that's our goal as we look at this. Some, however, look at this story as an allegory. That, that means you look at something and it has a picture of something else. In other words, the story of the voyage on the Mediterranean is like our life. And oftentimes our life has been pictured as a voyage on a sea. And when you get to the other end, that means you've died. So right now we're in a voyage, and sometimes you have rough sailing, sometimes it's smooth sailing. And some have looked at this and said, this is kind of an allegory, and it talks about life, and, and there's some ups and downs in that. Some have also looked at this as an allegory of church history. And so they say, in this story, we have a picture of church history. And it's demonstrated, especially when the Apostle Paul says, be careful, listen, don't do this, and nobody listens. And uh, that's what happens today in churches a lot of times, you know. Uh, the, the Lord gives warning and he talks about things not to do and sometimes people don't listen. Well, I want to say that when Luke was writing this, he had no such ideas of this in his mind. Uh, he's just writing the story, telling about what happened. And as we see what happened, we see one of the main characters involved in this. The main character in all this is the Apostle Paul. It's the Lord with him. And we're going to see his life when he gets into difficult, a difficult situation. <clears throat> Oftentimes, well, this seems to be true of life, character is revealed by difficult situations. 
Not that it is made, but it is revealed. You put somebody in a tight spot and their character is often revealed. It's like a tea bag. You have a tea bag and there it is sitting in, your, in a little pouch and, and you can take it out and set it on the counter and everything's okay. But when you put that tea bag in hot water, the content that's in that bag will come out and it'll come out into the water. And so often difficulties are like that with us. We can hide things, we can keep things in, but when we get to pressured situation, difficult happens, then the genuine character in our life shines and it comes out. And we're going to see that in the Apostle Paul's life. He's going to get into a situation where his life is at, is at, at risk several times. In fact, he alludes to this situation when he's talking in the book of 2 Corinthians and he's talking about the different troubles he had in life. And he says, I was shipwrecked several t- and a night and a day I was on the sea. He did not see the light, but can you imagine being 36 hours bobbing up and down in the water? Uh, that, that would be, I mean, it wouldn't take but like 36 minutes for me. You know? <laughs> that would be tough. But the Apostle Paul talks about uh, the difficulties of this journey. And this, we have six months that we're going to look at this. Now, we're not going to take six months, but, uh, but that's the time frame that he's dealing with. There's an interesting book just for your knowledge, just if you want to read this. It's called The Voyage and Shipwreck of St. Paul. And it's written by James Smith. This man got his own personal yacht <clears throat> and he traveled the same route that the Apostle Paul traveled in the Mediterranean in his own yacht at the same time of year that the Apostle Paul went. Now we'll know exactly the time of year because there's going to be date stamps that come along. And there's going to be date stamps that tell us, boom, this is what happened and this is what happened. And it has a time. And we can go back and know exactly when they were traveling. And so this man did this. And from that... Reading here in the book of Acts, this 27th chapter and 28th, he wrote a story about the Apostle Paul's life. Very interesting. The Voyage and Shipwreck of St. Paul by uh, James Smith. Let's begin in verse 1 of chapter 27 of Acts. And when it was determined, now the Apostle Paul stood before Agrippa, and Agrippa and Festus got together and said, Hey, this man, there's nothing worthy of death in him. There's nothing worthy of even confinement. And if he had not appealed to Caesar, he could go free. But he has appealed to Caesar, and so we've got to get him there. And so they sit back and they wait, and they're waiting for a ship that is coming. Now the Apostle Paul's in Caesarea. It's a coastal town, a big harbor there um, at that time, built by Herod the Great. And it was still a very one of the largest harbors in the Mediterranean. Alexandria, Egypt, was a major harbor, major harbor here at Caesarea. Lots of ship traffic. And so tri- ships were coming and going, And they're waiting for one that's going to be going to Rome. And while they're waiting, um, the Apostle uh, Paul is is here with them, and and Luke is writing. He said, when it was determined that we, and there's something that's very interesting, there's the first time since chapter 21 that we have the we again. Paul, uh, uh, Luke is with him, and at chapter 21, verse 18, it breaks away, and Luke is no longer with them. And he writes, they did that, they did this, they did these kind of things. Now he starts again with the word we. So Luke has joined the party again. He is with the Apostle Paul. And he's going to be with him the rest of the time. So in chapter 27 and 28, Luke, the Dr. Luke, is going to be with Paul traveling with him. And so we don't know where he was for the last two years. Because from the chapter 21 to to 27, there were two years in time that took place. And we don't know where Luke went. We know that he joined him, traveled, and went on some of the mission trips. But he resumes travel with him again. So, verse 27 again. When it was determined that we should sail into Italy, get him to Rome, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' Augustus' band. Julius is the uh, legendary centurion that had a good reputation, and history makes note of him. Um... There were other soldiers, up to 600 of them, and, uh, that were with, uh, that a centurion would be over uh, from 100 to 600 at times. And there are other prisoners, it says, that were here. We'll find out later in chapter 30, in verse 37, that there's a total of 276 of them. Paul and Luke and um, Aristarchus and Julius and Roman soldiers and prisoners all make up 276 and they're looking for a Ford Focus or a 
a Honda Accord or something small to get into. No, can you imagine that many people? And they're looking for a ride to Rome. So they're sitting out on the dock, you know, in Caesarea with their thumb out. Any ship going by, you know, kind of, <laughs> but they're looking for a ship going. Now, Rome had the right to hitch a ride with a ship that was going. But they're looking for a coasting ship. Ships that went along and bounced along the seacoast and they were moving their way along. They're looking for a, a, a ship like this to be able to take them along. And uh, Rome had a right to hitch a ride with them. It would be like having a bus, uh, our, our bus stops that we have today. You sit out at a curb, wait for the bus to come, bus comes through, you get on the bus and, and it's eventually going to go somewhere in a different, different place. Uh, their their um, ship service was often like that and oftentimes it hugged the coast because you didn't want to get too far out in the Mediterranean especially as the seasons changed and the waters became too choppy and so uh, they're a part of Augusta's band this is an honored um, position for Julius to be in because he was responsible for communication and courier um, if he had somebody to deliver somewhere this man was responsible to do this also uh, you had to be trusted because if the prisoners were somehow escaped, uh, Rome had a policy, your life could be taken. So you had to make sure that you kept them. And Julius had done well with that job. And uh, he is in that position. Verse 2 says, And entering into a ship of uh, Adramitium, uh, this is a city, or this is a, a little city that's on the coast there in Turkey, and they are in Caesarea here, and this ship is from way up here on the coast of Turkey. So it's way up here, and that ship is, is heading that way. And so they said, hey, this ship is going there. They find this place. And it said, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, along the, what we know as Turkey now. And then it says, one Aristarchus, a, Macedo uh, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. So here we have... Um, uh, Aristarchus, he was a believer that came to know the Lord from Thessalonica when the Apostle Paul went on his second missionary journey and was going through, came to uh, um, uh, the Macedonian call and uh, was that the second? I think that was the second missionary journey and went, went across, um, went into Philippi, then Thessalonica, then Aristarchus gets saved. He becomes a believer and we find him going along at times to be with the Apostle Paul and to aid him. And here he is. Now we understand, as a Roman, the Apostle Paul had privileges. Even though he was uh, accused and on his way to trial, uh, Rome allowed a, the Roman government allowed a Roman to travel with two personal attendants or, or slaves. And so here, the ones that the Apostle Paul had was Luke and Aristarchus, this man um, who was... Uh, been used of, of God to help the Apostle Paul in a lot of ways. He was the man that when the Apostle Paul went to Ephesus and uh, they were ready to uh, find Paul and they were ready to murder him and the whole city got together and they got in the arena and they're chanting, chanting and chanting and chanting and they're trying to get the Apostle Paul. They grabbed Gaius and this guy Aristarchus and they drug them into the arena um, in, uh, in Ephesus when they were there. And so this man had uh, been a prisoner with Paul. He had served well. And uh, here he is willing to go with the Apostle Paul, committing himself to be his personal attendant to go along with him. Now, I will say that there is no other mention of this man anywhere on this trip. So we're going to read the next two chapters and there's no mention of him. We don't know what happened to him. Did he go a long ways? And as the, the ship is traveling and it goes along and gets to this destination and it's, it's, in, it's close to his homeland, does he get off and go to his home? Um, because they're going to change ships at a certain point. And does he get off and when, it, when they change ships? I don't know. I do know that Colossians chapter 4 verse 10 as well as Philemon verse 24 when the Apostle Paul does arrive at Rome, Aristarchus is in the company of the Apostle Paul. So here are all the different things that we have. It appears that he is with him, but there is no mention of him. So there are things that go along. We say, well, you know, I'm, I'm serving the Lord and nobody makes mention of that. Here's a man, Aristarchus, no doubt serving Paul faithfully. No mention of him in Acts. God knows about it. <laughs> God's going to reward him for it. And that's all that counts for us. If, we get mentioned, if we're not mentioned for anything, if we're not commended for it here, 
That's okay. God knows about it. He will take care of it. And Aristarchus is a good uh, example of this man. He does not say, okay, okay, Luke, because you didn't mention me, I'm abandoning you and I'm not going to help the Apostle Paul anymore. <laughs> he didn't do that. He served faithfully until the Apostle Paul is actually beheaded in Rome. He stays faithfully with him, it seems to be. Verse 3, the next day we touched at Sidon. Now this is up the coast of Israel. Uh, we got Israel on the coast and you've got Caesarea, then you come to Haifa, uh, or you've got uh, Tel Aviv today, which was not a city then, and Haifa. And then you go up and you get into Lebanon and there's Tyre and Sidon, which are, are in Lebanon today. And they're very famous Old Testament cities. Sidon is one of them. And so they come to this place in Sidon. And this would have been a little bit of a travel here. And Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go into his friends to refresh himself. So they, they said, we're going to overnight here. Paul's a Roman. and said, okay, you get to go. And instead of staying on the ship here, you can go into town if you know people here. And you can stay over with them. No doubt he had a, a guard with him, perhaps. We don't know that for sure. But this is the first of several favors we find that the Apostle Paul gets as he's on this trip. And of several conversations that he's able to get involved in. And there are numerous examples in the scripture. Numerous, I'm saying you know, five or six examples of centurions that are presented in good favor. One of them was a centurion in uh, Capernaum where Jesus was serving. And uh, this man's son was very sick and about to die. And he besought the Lord, and he came and found Jesus where he was and said, My son is dead, uh, is sick, very sick. And Jesus said, Well, I will come. And he said, Look, you're a very busy man, and I understand authority. And if you just speak the word, he can be healed right here. You don't have to be there. I understand that. I know authority. And Jesus says to the people around him, he says, this, I haven't seen faith in, in everywhere, anywhere like in this man. And this was a Gentile man as a centurion uh, as, as a, under Rome. And yet all the people said, Oh, help him, Jesus. Help him. He is very worthy. He personally built our synagogue here. So help him, whatever he needs. So the Jews stood up for him. Um, Cornelius was a centurion. And Cornelius uh, besought Paul, uh, Peter rather, and said, I want to hear. An angel appeared to me. I want to hear the gospel. And Peter presents the gospel to him. And you know the... The, the Holy Spirit descends there. And Cornelius becomes the, the avenue that the gospel is open to the Gentile world. And he was a centurion, a Gentile. At the crucifixion, there was a centurion there. And uh, they, others wanted to abuse the Lord, and he wouldn't let them. And uh, they wanted to hold back, uh, giving him something to drink. And the centurion made sure at the very end he, he gave him something to drink, although the crucifixion was, would be something very horrible to be involved in. So here's another centurion that is... They were not, he was not a, a, a mean, belligerent person. He was very kind to the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> and so, here they come to this place, and there's a church in Sidon. Um, after the persecution in Acts chapter 11, verse 19, the persecution that came about after Saul, uh, Stephen's death. Saul of Tarsus was standing around holding the garments of people while they stoned Stephen. And after that, they said, let's get the other Christians. Let's get them. And while they're trying to get them, boom, persecution broke out, and they scattered everywhere. Acts chapter 11 verse 19 said they went as far as Tyre and Sidon in Phoenice, or what we know as Phoenicia. They went there and they preached the gospel and they started churches there. And so now the Apostle Paul, there's no record of him going there, but he's getting to go and meet churches. And it says here, they, they allowed him to go into his friends. It's a very interesting word, <clears throat> their friends. You know about this. You ever met somebody that's a Christian and you just met them for the very first time? You may go to a foreign country or you may be somewhere in America and you may be talking all of a sudden. You find out they're a Christian and you get to talking to them. And there's something about that. There's something, you know, this is, a, this is my, my brother and sister in Christ. And you, you bond with them and you're talking to them. That, that connection. This is this word here. This is this word. Paul found other believers and, and uh, he was allowed to go into his friends and uh, visit with them. And so, what a wonderful, wonderful example, even in all these different things that come up. Verse 4, And when we had launched from thence, okay, we left from Sidon, we sailed under Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. 
went south under the island of Cyprus, and maybe a map in your Bible, if you look at that sometime, you can see kind of what was going on. But this is the summer, and we know that they're leaving, and the winds were against you, and they were becoming more and more against you as the fall came on into the winter, and they would not change again until February, late February. So from now at the end of summer, all the way through fall and into the winter, the winds would be blowing um, straight to, from west to east. And they're trying to go west. <clears throat> now, they didn't have boats with motors like we have today. Get in a boat, turn that thing on, doesn't matter about the wind, you just go where you're going to go. They had to go by sail or by the winds. You could have a ship with a lot of slaves that would be rowing, and that took a lot. You'd have to have a lot of slaves. You've got to have a lot of food. You've got to have a lot of things to feed them as you're, as you're going. This ship used just the wind. And if you've got the wind blowing towards you the direction you need to go, you're going to have a difficult time. And so it says here we had to go under Cyprus because we had to find some, some winds that would, be, would help us. And... This is just a little small example of the detail Luke is going to give us. Why even state this? <laughs> I mean, okay, it took us a little while to get there. But Luke is very detailed in this. It's very interesting, his, his uh, perspective. And as we're looking, he's, they're going to be hugging the shore all along the way, as close as they can get without rub, rubbing the bottom of the ship so that they can stay and, and get some favorable, wind, favorable winds. A little bit later, we're going to read a word that means basically that they zigzagged. Okay, you're going into winds. They're coming at you. So you can't go at them because the wind's going to push you back. So you've got to go zigzag back and forth, back and forth, just to be able to make it going anywhere, anyway that way. I mean, and it's very tedious. And this is why it took six months where you could do this in one day today. And uh, it took them six months to travel this. And so they're going back and forth, back and forth, trying to gain a little bit of advantage as they're going into the wind, into the wind, into the wind. And uh, very difficult sa sailing. Verse 5, And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. Here again are um, uh, other texts and other commentaries have this, that this uh, took them 15 days from the time of le le leaving Caesarea to get to this one little port here. So we're talking about very slow travel. And Amicia is a, I mean, <clears throat> Alicia is a, uh, like a county, as we'd understand, a county. And uh, this Myra is a port there. And so they made it to this port. And verse 6, And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy. So here we're going to change ships. <clears throat> and... Uh, one is going west. This ship maybe has got to its destination. We're here now. Now it's time to go back and repeat the course. Go all the way back around. Go back to Alexandria. Maybe go back and bump along. And they're bringing supplies along. Different things. So they've met their... They've gone as far as they can go. Now they're going to find another ship and change out. And they found this ship from Alexandria. Alexandria is a large port in Egypt. And it says here... <coughs> Uh, verse 6, they found a ship sailing into Italy, and, and he said, he, he put us therein. And when we had sailed slowly many days, again going zigzagging, zigzagging back and forth, back and forth, and there's the idea of sailing slowly, and scarce were come over against uh, Snidus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against uh, Salmoni. So here we have again a busy port, these different things. I mean, today we're looking at these things, and there, there are cities there. They're, the goal is to try to, as you look at your map, what they're trying to do, they're trying to go west and then, then they're going to dip down and they're going to try to dip down and, and hit some land so they can kind of go by the land and as they go by the land they'll be missing some of the wind that's out in the open. Some of that, the mountains and all will block the wind and they can move along along the coast a little better. So this is their goal. Now this ship of Alexandria was a grain ship. Rome received most of its grain supply from Alexandria. The wheat there, wheat and things like that. We're going to find out a little bit later that it is a grain ship. It does have grain on it. But they had room for these passengers. So they bring them all on board. And here they go on their way. And their goal was to get this grain to Rome. You're going to Rome? We want to go with you. And they jump on. Now, it says here after they 
they came, verse, verse, when they came to this place here, um, they, they have two different choices of things that they can do when they're at this one port they're talking about. They can stay there and wait for good weather, which is going to be about three months for them, maybe a little longer, because they're at the end of summer, fall's coming. They're going to have to wait until November, uh, I mean until uh, uh, February, or they can drop down and go under Crete, and this is exactly what they did. So they, they dropped down and they went in this direction. Verse 8, And hardly passing it, or coming real close to the island of Crete, we came into the place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lacia. So here we have, uh, again, different places. We're, the island of Crete's 160 miles long. Fair Havens is right in the middle. So they're doing this zigzagging thing along the coast, trying to get as far as they can get, and they get to this place called Fair Havens. Today, it is a city, and it's basically called Fair Havens. Lamonius Callus, and that's, that's uh, um, the word Fair Havens. Um, they, there was a, another, you have this Salmoni, Fair Havens, and on the other end, you have this place that's called Phoenix. It's not called that. It's, uh, it's, um, we'll see it in just a little bit here in these, these verses, but that's the name of the city that they had on the other, uh, other side of the island. Well, from your direction, this would be on the um, uh, east side of the island, the middle, and then the west side of the island of Crete that is long and narrow. And they're sailing under this to try to get as far as they can go. Then they're going to eventually break out and go, go over to Rome. But the winds are pushing at them and pushing them back. And they say, we've got to figure out what we're going to do. In verse 9, And now, when much time was spent, when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. There we have a time stamp. And that time stamp is the fast. The fast is referring to the Day of Atonement. And we know when that falls in the year. And so they're sitting here in this port. It's called the Fair Havens. It's a, little, it's a smaller port. They're saying, what do we do? The winds are not favorable to us. Do we want to try to go and get closer to Rome? And, and do we want to try to get over to the other side? Uh, or do we want to try to stay here? And what should we do? And so they're spending time waiting and waiting and waiting to see if they're going to get good winds. And while they're waiting for, for good winds, winter is coming on, and it's coming on. And winter is not a good time to travel. From September the 11th through November the 11th, this time of year is very dangerous for them. After November the 11th this time, practically sailing on the Mediterranean would shut down at this time of year. The winds were too strong and too contrary. And so they would go by land, which would be a lot longer, but you were safer on land. And then after February, it would pick back up again. Now, the, the, the Day of Atonement, which is the word fast, what the word fast here means, is found in the Old Testament. It's Tishri 10. And uh, that fell on in this date, which is, we're gonna, we, we find out later, is A.D. 59, when this is taking place. The date of this is October the 5th. So now they're in October the 5th. They're right in the middle of this dangerous time. From September the 11th to November the 11th, Dangerous sailing, but some would risk it. After November, you, you're going to be in very dangerous territory. And so they're at this October the time, right in the middle here. What are we going to do? What should we do? And Paul gives them some advice. He gives them some admonition. And he says in verse 10, Paul said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with, with hurt and much damage, not only to the lading, but also uh, of our lives. So here the Apostle Paul is saying, his advice is, guys, I'm advising you, I think we ought to stay right here in Fair Havens and let's wait out the winter here. When the spring comes again, or when, the, when February comes, and the winds become favorable to us, then we can go. That would be my advice. You ever given somebody good advice before? You knew it was good advice? Now, the Apostle Paul is not just giving them advice. God has met with him. He has, he has talked to the Lord about this situation. And he's talking to God. And God has given him some insight. And he's giving that insight to them. And we're going to see what they do with that. And see if that has ever happened to you. But Paul says, I think we ought to stay here, and if we try to go forward, it's going to be too costly to us. It's going to be costly to the ship, to the contents of the ship, and even possibly our lives, the crew and the passengers. 
It could cost us lives. And so verse 11 says, Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship. The pilot is the word master. He was the owner and he was also the pilot. So he's directing and he's steering his own ship. And the, the centurion, Julius, asked him, Hey, what do you think? You travel these waters all the time. What do you think? And he says, I think we can go for it. Paul just said, I don't think we ought to go. Here's the owner of the ship, and he does this all the time, and he says, I think we can go for it. And the centurion, verse 11, believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. Does that sound familiar to you? <laughs> Does that sound familiar to you at times when something like that has happened? Here we have experience versus the revelation of God. Which one would you go with? Which one would you go with? Experience or the revelation of God? I think I'd go with the revelation of God. What God has said. Now this is not the Apostle Paul saying, I'm afraid. Oh, it's risky. I don't think we ought to do it. Oh. It's like the little girls at camp, you know, when the wind blew. And it didn't blow down there near as hard as it blew here. But we had some wind blow up, you know, and the wind blew. And all, little girls, not Sarah at all, but some of the little girls, oh, they're crying. Oh. We all, the, 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 the counselors are hugging them. And Olivia said, it wasn't just the little girls. Olivia had 13-year-old girls in her cabin. 13-year-old girls were crying. <laughs> They're crying. And, All right, let's sing some songs, God. We've got to do something. And I, I said, you know, we, we're memorizing for our God night time. I got up in front of them and I told them, we're memorizing that God is our God and we get to trust Him even in trouble. That's what we're memorizing. We get the chance to put that into practice. So we're going to trust God in this. <laughs> They're going to cry anyway. All right. They ain't listening. Shoot. You know what? Nothing new. I mean, nothing new to me. You say things, nobody listens. All right. you know, no, Paul, you know, you're used to that, you know. But uh, <clears throat> here he gives them some instruction, and uh, they want to listen to him. Practical advice he gives them was, it was, uh, okay, I think we ought to stay here. The ship owner said, there is a better port for us to get in for the winter. There's a better port just a little ways around the corner. Just a little ways. If we can just go a little ways, there's a better port there. And Julius made the final decision. And he says, okay, if that's what we're going to do, if that's what you think, that's what we'll do. Now, the problem is that there are gusts that come up during this time. And the chance of a cyclone or a gust of wind coming up. Can you imagine being in a ship when the winds that blew through here on Thursday? Can you imagine being in a ship with sails and, a, and winds like that coming up and blowing and you don't even see it coming? Now, we could see the wind coming in, at camp where we were. We could just see it coming. Something's coming. Of course, we had our radar. We had our, um, uh, uh, we had our cell phones and we had computer. So we're watching the storm coming. But you can look out and say, look at what's coming. Wow. And all of a sudden, boom, the wind blew through there and... And it blew a little while, and then it wasn't so bad. And then, then you know, that's when the crying took place. <laughs> okay, calm down. It's okay. We're going to make it. And then the rain pretty much went around us. The storm was over. We were fine. But I could not imagine being out in a ship and something like that happening. The chance of that happening on the Mediterranean is great, even today. Gusts of wind came down onto the Sea of Galilee at times. And it happens today because of the elevation difference. The Sea of Galilee is down below the Mediterranean. And you know how hot air, hot air can, can hold up the cold air and all of a sudden the cold air can break through the hot air and swoop down and cause gusts of winds to blow. And this happened on the, the Sea of Galilee. We, know, we read about that. It happens today. Of course, they have better ships and they're able to, to fight that off and there's no, no, no fear in some of them today. But being in one of these ships out in the Mediterranean when this happened, I mean, sorry. Well, the chance of that happening is great. And they said, well, let's take the risk. And he didn't listen to the Apostle Paul. This is where people look at this and say, this is an allegory of the church. <laughs> because Paul gives warning, and a lot of people don't even listen to the warning. They go on and say, I'm going to do what I want to do. And they find themselves running ashore or having shipwreck of their lives. That's what happens at times. You can warn people. They're going to make their decision. You can't make the decisions for them. The Apostle Paul tried to give in in encouragement. They didn't listen. Now, what was Paul's response to the authority around him? Um, we're going to find out his response. 
They've got authority over him. He had a revelation from God. And they're not listening to the revelation from God. And they're saying, you know what? I think we better go on. And we're going to go on. Paul says, you better listen to me. I'm not budging. You're a prisoner. You've got to go. I'm putting my foot down. Because this is, this is what... You're not listening to me. When you get in a situation like that and you are in a position you have authority over, you know what you have to do? You have to do what the Apostle Paul did. You have to trust them and trust God and you've got to go forward even when there's sometimes things that you say, okay, this doesn't seem like this is a good idea. Now we're not talking about blatant sin. They're saying, okay, you need to go out and kill somebody. Okay, I guess i got to go do it. You know? But we're talking about decisions that you say, well, I don't think I would do it that way. They're the authority. You trust God and go forward. And this is exactly what the Apostle Paul does. We have a wonderful example. So he's, okay, he's quiet for now and goes forward. Now, verse 12, we have that, um, that the, and because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence, if by any means they might attain to Phoenice. Or this is the place that we call Phoenix. But this, this, these are two different, same places, but two different names for them. And there to winter. That's a much better place over here. This is on the end of the island, and we can launch from there right over to Italy. And it's a big harbor. In fact, it's open. It's an open harbor. And we can get there. And it says it's uh, there to winter, which is a haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and toward the northwest. The idea here of this is that it was open to the north and the south, all the way open, north and south, on the west side of the island. It was a big harbor, open. And we can get over there and we can wait the winter out there. It's a much better harbor. Let's go. So verse 13 says, And when the south wind blew softly, ah, oh, it's slowing down. We don't have much wind. It's not, it's not hurting. Let's go. Supposing they had obtained their purpose, loosing from thence, they sailed close by Crete. They said, All right. The winds have calmed down. They're not blowing in our face so much. It's time to go. We only have a little distance. Let's go for it. And we're going to stay close to the island anyway. Are they going to be okay? Stay tuned next time. But anyway, you know, <laughs> we'll pick up and see but verse 13. How many people, as you look at this, you think about this, I think about the Apostle Paul and just this one little lesson as we're looking at this. How many people want to do their own thing? They, they have their minds made up and they're going to do their own thing. They're not going to listen to advice. They're not going to be careful. Even revelation from God... You can show them revelation from God. Here's what God says. Mine's already made up. We've got to be careful that we're not like that. We don't want to be like that. We're, we're so determined to do something. We're so determined to do something that we're going to go and charge in. and We've got to say, okay, I want to find out what's, what the Lord wants me to do. I want to be able to listen to advice. If it's godly advice, if it's, if it's based on the scriptures, and be careful. Some people don't want to do what God wants to do. <clears throat> I mean, just face it. There's people that do not want to do what God wants them to do. And uh, you'll, you'll find them. You'll run into them in life. Um, Julius listens to those around and, and hears more experienced people. And other people advised. Every, other people got involved. So we have Paul in the minority with the ship owner and Julius. He's, he's weighing out. And other people got involved with him and said, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So Paul against all the rest of them. Well, I'm going to ask you, and you, you might know the answer already. I'm, I'm sure you probably do, but I wonder which one of those was right. <laughs> What's going to happen? Well, they're going to stick the nose of their ship out, and one of those 90-mile-an-hour gusts is going to hit that ship and drive that ship away from the island, completely ungovernable, drive them out into the Mediterranean, and they have no control over it. And they lose complete control. Nothing they can do about it. And Paul dies right there in that ship. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what happened? No, no, it doesn't happen. But stay tuned next time. We'll pick up.